Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem integer break. I saw some people on my Discord were working on this problem and I realized I didn't have a video solution for it. So here we go. We're given an integer n and we want to break it up into a bunch of positive integers and we have to break it up into at least two integers. That's what they mean by k is greater than or equal to two. And we want to break it up into integers such that we maximize the product of those integers. What that means is if we have an integer 5 and we break it up into some integers, let's say 2 and 3, the product of these integers, which is the multiplication, is going to be 2 times 3, which is 6. And so in this case, for this example 5, what we actually want to return is not the integers themselves, but that product, that maximum product, which in this case is 6. So in this example, n equals 2, so we want to break up 2. Now you might think, can we just do 1 and 2? No, that doesn't work, because when they say break up the integer, that means that the, the broken pieces of that integer have to sum up back into the result. So we can't just break it up like that. We have to break it up into 1 and 1. I guess we can break it up into uh, 0 and 2. Two, but actually that doesn't work because remember each integer has to be positive so the good thing is we're guaranteed that the integer that we're given in this case n equals 2 is always going to be greater than or equal to 2 so it will be possible to break it up but in this case the only way we can break it up is 1 and 1 if you multiply 1 and 1 together we get a result of 1 so that is the maximum that we can do that's the result in this case but it's even smaller than the original value Okay, so now let's try to understand how we can solve this problem, and we're going to be doing it differently from most videos. I'm going to be coding the solution at the same time as we understand the solution, and let me know if you think this is more helpful or if you just prefer doing the drawing first. So let's say we're given n equals 5. We want to know what's the maximum way we can break up 5, and we do have to break it up into at least two different values. And actually, I'm going to replace this with 4 to keep our decision tree to be a little bit shorter. Now we want to break up 4 into at least two different integers to maximize the product of those integers and then return it. So one way we could break 4 up is to break it up into 1 and 3. We can't do 0 and 4 because the integers both have to be positive, so 1 and 3 is a valid way to do it. Another way to do it would be to do 2 and 2. These are both positive integers. And the third way is to do 3 and 1. So obviously we kind of have two paths that are pretty much the same, but that's okay. We know that's going to happen some of the time. Now what's going to be the product of these two values? 1 times 3 is 3. 2 times 2 is going to be 4. And 3 times 1 is also going to be 3. So obviously out of all three of these, the maximum is 4. But this example was very simple. And actually, how do you know we're done at this point? We have... A, a 1 and a 3 on this path, for example, we can't really break up the 1 anymore. That's kind of a base case, right? The integer 1 cannot be broken up anymore. And actually, this is a good moment to start writing out the code. Even though we're not entirely sure of what the solution is, we're starting to see that maybe recursion is going to help because as I mentioned, this 1 is a base case. It can't be broken down further. But if we really wanted to, we could possibly break this 3 up even more. But we don't have to break up the 3, right? We were required to break up the 4 because it's the integer we were given as the input. But these sub-problems that we have, we are not required to break them up further. We can if it maximizes the result, but if it doesn't maximize the result, we shouldn't break it up. But in this case, 3, we have multiple decisions. We have one decision, we can leave it as it is. We can leave 3 as it is, we don't break it up any further. We have another decision of breaking it up into a 1 and a 2, and we have another decision to break it up into a 2 and a 1. And if we chose this path, we're not going to obviously break up the 3 more. But for these, we can't break up the 1, but we can maybe break up the 2. But if we break up the 2, we get 1 and 1. These multiplied together is going to be 1. So would we prefer having a 1 or would we prefer having a 2 that hasn't been broken up? Obviously, we would prefer the 2. So we're going to leave this as it is. These two multiplied together are going to be 2. These two multiplied together are going to be 2. We're not going to break up this 2 either. 
And so among these three, we're just going to choose the maximum, three, two, or two. Obviously, three is the maximum. So what we learned from this whole, you know, annoying decision tree is that what we should do is just leave the three as it is. There's no need to break it down any further. So now I'm actually going to start coding it up because we kind of get the uh, recursive logic. I'm going to create a function DFS. It's a recursive function defined inside of our root function. And we're only going to pass in what number we're breaking down. And as I mentioned, there is a base case. If n is equal to one, that means it can't be further broken down. And you know what we can return is just one. And we're also gonna have a variable result, which we're initially gonna set to zero, but I'm actually gonna change that in a moment. So then we're gonna create a for loop because we're given a number num and we can break it up into many portions. We're gonna use a loop to determine how we're going to break it up. And I, in this case, I should actually call it L for the left portion, but I'll leave it as I. This I is going to represent the size of the left uh, portion of the value that has been broken up. And it's going to go all the way up until the number. In Python, this num is non-inclusive. So for example, if num was four in this case, the way our loop would execute is I would be one, then it would be two, then it would be three, similar to how we have over here, right? I in this case is going to be the left value. It's going to be the one, or it's going to be the two, or it's going to be the three. If we want the right value, we can get it very easily easily let me show you how we can just take a uh, self dot dfs is what we're going to recursively call on each of the portions. So I is the left portion multiplied by self dot dfs of num minus I because we want both of these portions to add up to the original which is num. And so we're going to set this equal to value and we want our result to always be the maximum, right? What's the maximum way we were able to break these down? So we're going to set our result equal to the max of itself and the return value that we got a moment ago. And that's actually the entire recursive logic of this entire problem. We're just going to go ahead and return result. And then we can call our DFS passing in N. N is the input parameter that we were originally given. And this solution will actually work, but it won't get passed on leak code because it's not efficient enough. And actually this won't work. There was one little thing that I was actually going to talk about and that's our result. Here if we leave result as it is and then try to break up the number with this for loop, we're basically doing what we did right over here. We are required to break up the four. That's why we initially set result equal to zero because the result is only going to be set to broken up values. But there are other problems, right? Like sub problems like three in this case, we're not required to break three up. It's going to go through the recursive portion of our DFS. It's not going to stop at the base case. But with the code we have right now, the three is not going to remain as a three. It's going to probably end up being a two times one, which is going to be two. How do we fix that? Well, in our code, what we can say is result will be set to zero if the input num is equal to n, which it was the original value we were given. Else, if it's not equal to n, then it can initially be set to the number num. All this line is doing is making sure that we guarantee that the original value will be broken down, but the sub problems like three and two don't necessarily have to be broken down. They can potentially be set to the values themselves. But as you can see with this drawing, we might be, you know, doing the same sub problem multiple times. For example, we might try breaking up this three and doing that recursive work. And then over here, we might be doing the exact same thing. And to get around this, we're going to use a technique called caching, a dynamic programming technique. So I'm going to uh, refer to our cache as DP. The way I'm going to initialize it is one is going to map to one, meaning that the base case is one. And every time we determine other values, for example, we know that if we try to break down three, the maximum way we can possibly break it down is into three itself, right? Just leaving it as it is, is the best way. So when we solve that problem, we're going to end up throwing it into our cache so that we don't have to resolve it a second time in our decision tree. And it's pretty easy to code it up. Just I'm going to replace this base case with another base case. If the number num is already in in our cache in our DP, then we're going to return DP of that num. So since I initialized our cache with mapping one to one, our, our original base case will be preserved, but this is actually more powerful as well.
And here, instead of using the variable result, I'm gonna use dp uh, at the num as the key. And this line val can stay the same. Here result will be changed to dp of num and here we'll change it to dp of num and this is gonna be changed to dp of num. And actually it's not good enough because I was stupid. Uh, since this function is defined inside of a function, we don't have to use self to refer to it, but the rest of this should work. And if all you wanna do is get this passed on leak code, this should be good enough. As you can see on the left side, this does pass pretty efficiently on leak code. And the time complexity in this case is not gonna to be too bad. You can see that from each problem, so for example, if we're given n, we're gonna be solving the subproblems from one all the way up until n. To solve each subproblem, it's an O of n time operation because in our recursive uh, function, you can see we just have a single for loop, which is the bulk of the complexity. And we're guaranteed with our caching that each of these subproblems is only gonna be solved once. So the time complexity is going to be big O of n squared. And space is gonna be big O of N from our cache as well as from our recursive call stack. But we can actually solve this problem without recursion. We can do the true dynamic programming solution. As we talked about, there's a bunch of sub problems, right? So for example, we are given N equals four and we are trying to determine the DP value, the max integer break value of four. But we know that to, to get that value, if we wanna break four up, we're gonna break it up into smaller numbers like three and one, two and two, one and three. So it's better for us to solve those sub problems, in this case, one, two, and three. And if we solve these sub problems first, then solving this problem should be easy, right? Because we can just try uh, the three decisions as I kind of showed up above. And the good thing is we know that the base case of one is just one. We know that two can only be broken up into two different values, right? One and one, and those multiplied together are one. And we also saw with three that there's two ways to break three up, right? Into one and two. So how would we do this? This is probably a good time to get into our code. We're gonna leave this as our base case. So we're actually gonna leave the cache unchanged. I'm gonna leave the recursive solution below, but let's start doing the DP solution. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be building this from left to right. We're gonna start at one, or actually one has already been computed, so we should probably start at two and then work our way up all the way up until four, which is our N value in this case. So for I in range from two all the way up until N, but in Python, this n is non-inclusive. So we, if we actually do wanna stop after iterating through n, we should do this until n plus one. And actually, instead of calling it i, I'm gonna call it num just to match up with our uh, recursive solution below. But the rest is actually gonna be very similar to the recursive solution. For example, we're gonna initialize our dp of num and it's so similar that I'm actually just gonna copy and paste these two lines because if you were doing this in a coding interview, what I would recommend is uh, maybe even just solve the recursive problem first and then get into the dynamic programming solution uh, unless you can automatically jump to the DP solution. DP of num is gonna be set to zero if uh, we are at the, uh, the root value that we're trying to compute, right? This result, this target value all the way to the right. But if we're not at that value, we know that the DP of that value uh, can be at least the number itself. And that actually made me realize I made a mistake in this drawing, actually. When we got to two, we know that breaking two up into integers uh, can only be done one and one, and those multiplied together equal one. But we know that the original value can actually be used as long as we're not at the last value we're trying to compute. So actually for two, we can put a two value here. The DP value should never be smaller than the N value as long as we're not at the last value we're trying to compute because we know this one has to be broken down, right? We can't just keep a four. We have to break it up into multiple integers. That was the rule of the problem statement. But otherwise, we are still gonna be iterating through the loop, right? We're gonna be breaking this integer num into portions. I is gonna be one portion. So we wanna know for I, what's the max product it could be? And to get that, we can use dp of I. So instead of calling DFS to get it, we're just using the dp itself because we know it's already been computed. If we're trying to compute the dp value for two, or in this case, if we're trying to compute the dp value for three, 
we know that dp of 2 and dp of 1 have already been computed, so we can easily refer to those. So we're going to get dp of i multiplied by dp of num minus i, just like in the recursive solution, and we're going to set our dp of num, which is what we're actually trying to compute, equal to the max and actually let's set this equal to val and then on the next line we're going to be setting our dp of num which is what we're originally trying to compute equal to the max of itself and the value that we just computed up above so how this would work in the three case so in this case we know that three can actually only be broken up one way into one and two and then you take those two values in the dp part and multiply them together one times two is going to be two uh, but we also know we can use the original value itself so we can put this as three uh, but for the interesting case which is four as we drew up above we know we could broke, break it down into one way one and three and then take these two values one and three multiply them together we get three or we could break it down into two and two if we take two and multiply it with itself we get four we know that that is bigger so four is going to be the result in this case even though we weren't allowed to use the original value for we were still able to create four by using its pieces which were two and two right and you can draw this out for a larger example like five or six or whatever you want to do so after all that's done we wanted to return what's the maximum we could break n up into so we can return dp of n as our result and now let's make sure that it works and as usual i made a stupid mistake we're not doing dp of num minus one we're doing dp of num minus i stupid mistake by me but now let's run the code it should work and as you can see on the left yes it does work so this is a true dynamic programming solution the time and space complexity is still the exact same but I know some interviewers prefer the DP solution and some viewers like to understand this solution so I really hope that this was helpful if it was please like and subscribe it really supports the channel a lot consider checking out my patreon where you can further support the channel if you'd like and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon thanks for watching